Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and get started at this point with um, some things on the map. And I'd like to uh, quickly spend a few minutes on looking at the uh, land of Canaan and looking at the departure from Egypt by the children of Israel. Um, I enjoy maps and I enjoy looking at this kind of uh, stuff with uh, seeing where the children of Israel went. So here on the um, uh, map here, if you can see, this is just a really drawn out picture of a map, obviously. And um, <clears throat> the nation of Israel is just a tiny little piece of land on this map. Um, so the nation of Israel is this little section right here about the length of my finger on that map. So real small area, but a uh, very uh, desired area, if you will. Everybody uh, willing to kill each other to get it, you know, and to control it. So this is an older map here of the tribal areas. Um, so each of the colored areas. Just interesting towards the bottom. You can see uh, the tribe of Judah, that large red part. And the tribe of Judah was, was the most populated tribe most of the time. And, um, of course, Jerusalem is in the tribe of Judah. And so that would be really the focus of, of the future generations. <clears throat> so some tribal areas. Here's a map that shows the... Um, the departure from Egypt and the children of Israel going up to the land of Canaan. Um, the black line shows the traditional route down into the Sinai Peninsula. And the red line generally, you know, there's alternate routes, but generally shows the other route going over, not into Sinai being here, but Sinai being here. And so that seems to me to make a lot more sense with the... Uh, the children of Israel crossing the right arm of the Red Sea rather than the left arm of the Red Sea. And so uh, that <clears throat> kind of shows you the, the different routes of the Exodus. And God, of course, led them not directly to Israel from Egypt. He led them away from Israel and land of Canaan for a little while and then back up into uh, the land of Canaan. So um, 40 years of wandering, what they eat? Manna. What was manna? Angel food. Angel food. Cake. Anybody else? What was it? Heavenly food, right? So, I don't know. I like to think that someday when we get to heaven, we'll eat manna. You know, um, it's bread from heaven. The Bible literally calls it that. Uh, and then here's some of the tribes. <clears throat> and uh, I'll use this... Uh, this uh, map here as well. Um, I like to see topography, and so here on you know, this map you can see this as well, <clears throat> but very rugged. The land of Canaan, this, this little area, a couple hundred miles long from top to bottom, only about 50 miles wide at its widest, but uh, this entire fault line through here is, uh, you know, is uh, very volatile. Uh, lowest point on earth is the Dead Sea. So we were down there not that long ago, right down next to Masada, and um, went out. Uh, our hotel was actually down here as well. But um, the lowest place on earth, so that's pretty crazy. You know, this is sea level here, just 40, 50 miles away, and this is that low. And of course, uh, the reason is because it's on this fault line. So. <clears throat> Remember, the land of Canaan is divided into three sections if you're going, let's go west to east. So there's the, the shore or the plains. So the plains of Sharon, the plains of, of Akko, the, there's different plains that are listed out along here. The Philistine plain down here towards the bottom, um, plain of Akko up here. Anyway, so uh, there's the plains along the uh, Mediterranean. Then you have the central mountains. Central mountains are uh, Samaria, Galilee, Jerusalem, all of this uh, on these central mountains. And then you have the Jordan Valley. So remember, uh, even the Sea of Galilee is, is low in elevation. Water comes from Mount Hermon and from some springs up in here and feeds this water course. And of course, it ends at the Dead Sea. <clears throat> 
So why is the Dead Sea called the Dead Sea? Anyone speak out? Caleb. Okay, but why is there so much salt in there? So I'll ask the next question. Yes, uh, Jeremy. Sorry? Sulfur. Sulfur? There is, but that still doesn't really answer the question of why it's dead then. Yes? It doesn't have a natural drain, so it fills up and nothing comes, goes out of it. That's exactly right. So it stops there. There's no outlet for the water to go anywhere. And so because it's so hot and because there's sulfur and other things around there, the minerals in the Dead Sea, uh, you know, they've learned how to use those things, but they're, they're very plentiful down in there. So any of you have any minerals from the Dead Sea? Uh, Emily, Whew. couldn't remember all of a sudden. <clears throat> so uh, very um, salty, very mineral rich, and of course you can go down float in the water, which that's kind of fun to do. So um, I did it for the first time this last time we were over there. And I found out, by the way, that uh, I, I never even thought about it, that you don't, put, you don't swim in the Dead Sea. You don't put your face underwater. Um, you do that and your eyes will be burning like never before, you know. <laughs> if you have any of the slightest little cuts or anything, you know, I shaved, I'm telling you, man, you get that wet with all that salt and it just burns. So it was an interesting experience, to say the least. I didn't stay in very long. Uh, well, it was chilly also for some, we were at the time, there at the time of year when it was chilly. <coughs> Amen. By the way, some of, you, some, of, some of you have gum. No gum. Get rid of the gum. Did you get it? Leave it. A little tune along with the teaching. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's west to the east. Now let's look from north to the south again. Um, so we have the Galilee region to the north. Galilee, of course, named after the Sea of Galilee, but the whole region is known as the Galilee. Nazareth is right here in the middle of it and many other little, little cities there. The central area is Samaria. <clears throat> known generally as Samaria. Of course, there's an actual city of Samaria up in here as well, Shechem. Um, but the entire area is known as Samaria. And then to the south, it became known as Judah or Judea in, in the Greek translation. So uh, the tribe of Judah, this area to the south. So these are the three general areas. Um, when you think of the nation of Israel as it was in the time of the divided kingdom, it wasn't divided three ways, it was divided two ways. There was Samaria with the capital at Samaria, uh, the northern kingdom, and then there was the southern kingdom of Judea with the capital at Jerusalem. And uh, so that it would be only divided two ways in that case. Okay, any questions on that? Any thoughts? All right. Um, in the book of Numbers, at the point where uh, Moses sends the 12 spies into the land, they're way down here at, um, well, here's Beersheba. So somewhere south of here um, would be the place known as uh, Kadesh Barnea. From Kadesh Barnea is where they sent these spies all the way up into the land. And the Bible says literally that they went all the way up to Dan, Laish, and they scouted out the entire country. They traveled uh, several hundred miles in their, uh, in their exploration in 40 days. Of course, right here, around the south end of this, uh, here where Hebron is, um, that was where they met the most trouble, the sons of Anak and the Anakim, or giants in the land. And look at that word. It's similar, very similar to the word that's used in Genesis chapter 6 where there were giants in the earth. So I don't know if these are leftover, yeah, I don't know, devil children, demon children, leftover. Anyway, so we've never liked tall people since. Okay. Austin's not here today. <laughs> anyway, so uh, these spies were sent in from this area. So for some reason, Moses, I don't know exactly why, God knows what he's doing, the, the cloud led them here, but for some reason, 
the, the plan was to go in from the south. And when Joshua takes over, when we're going to see here in Joshua chapter 4 or 5, where when, when Joshua comes on the scene as far as the leader, he doesn't attack from the south. They come back to Kadesh Barnea and then they go around the, sea, the Dead Sea. They go all the way up onto the mountain plain and they come at it from the side and they hit Jericho first. And so the idea is not to attack from the long ways because evidently during this 40 years of wandering, the uh, land of Canaan had become much more unified or there were confederacies of kings. And we find that in Joshua where these southern kings had all joined together, 31 kings. And in the north, five kings. These, so there were these confederacies joined up, built up. And so Joshua's plan, instead of attacking each of those, he's going to split this and divide them with his 600,000 man army and attack the south first and then go to the north. So that's what he's going to do. He's going to branch off and head around the south. Of course, down here in this area in Moab, um, there was, uh, of course, Balaam who tried to uh, sidetrack them and get God's curse upon them. And so that would happen over here as they're going around. Um, so let me just quickly show you. I've got a couple pictures here. Okay, this uh, picture, well, you can hardly see it, but these are people hiking here. Okay, and see all this? So this area, this is down close to where they believe Kadesh Barnea to have been. Um, so it's a very rugged area, of course, Children of Israel didn't travel on little trails. Uh, two million people don't travel on a trail. Uh, they travel in a valley. And so these huge valleys as they made their way through them. Um, that's me 10 years ago, 11 years ago. It's the same idea. It's down south of Beersheba quite a ways, about 15 miles south of Beersheba, down in the country. Um, the uh, deliverer, if you will, of... Uh, the, the guy who helped found Israel in 1947, um, David Ben-Gurion, he was a general. Anyway, there's a lot of details, but he, he has a, a home. He had a home in the wilderness that he carved out of the wilderness not far from here, uh, way down south in the desert. There was nothing there except sand and rock when he got there. And if you go there today, his, his burial place and everything's there and a huge area, 100, 150 acres or so, all grassy, nice green trees growing. He found a little bit of water and he figured out how to make that water produce. And everything is you know, sprinkled all the time. Everything directly carved out of the wilderness. And there's all kinds of deer and roebuck and you know, whatever. The Bible talks, you know, ibex and so on. Uh, running around freely on his property there. So it's a pretty neat place uh, if you ever do go to Israel to go see that. But anyway, that's down there in the desert close to Kadesh Barnea where that would have been. Okay, <clears throat> Joshua. Let's go. Joshua. I'm going to take you to the book of Joshua and um, we'll try to go fairly quickly through this. Obviously, we don't do verse by verse in Old Testament survey, uh, unless we're in Genesis, right? Uh, we pretty much went through Genesis too, a little too slowly, but I enjoy very much going through the book of Genesis. <clears throat> okay. All right, so uh, I'm calling this Conquest and Conflict. Um, I have a class, actually, that I teach called Conquest and Judges. And we focus on this time period of about 400 years. But um, so the book of Joshua is a, a huge transition. Okay, so Moses, of course, writes the Pentateuch, compile, probably compiles Genesis and writes the rest of it, or at least the vast majority of it. Uh, it's real funny, you know, the Bible, Moses writing in the book of Numbers, and he says, now Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. Isn't that funny? Uh, talking about himself. But I'm sure God had him put that in there, you know. 
Uh, of course, Moses records his own death also at the end of Deuteronomy. But th this transition from Moses to Joshua now is going to be a very great transition, very important transition. And so I don't really want to get too much into this, but Joshua had been well prepared for this. He had seen Moses. He was right there with Moses all the way through the wilderness wanderings. Um, do, do you realize that when Moses went on top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, you realize that Joshua was close by. We don't know where, the Bible doesn't say, but he was on the mountain. He was not down there worshiping the golden calf with Aaron. Okay, he was, you remember when Moses comes back down the mountain carrying the Ten Commandments, and Joshua says, Moses, sounds like war going on down there. Joshua is with Moses on the mountain. So there's lots of examples like that where Joshua had been very well prepared to take over once Moses was gone. <clears throat> so, um, so do we ever find Moses writing in, the, in uh, Genesis, like where the Bible says that he wrote things down? Of course, right? He wrote the ten. He... He received the Ten Commandments, he read them, he wrote the words after um, Amalek, when they defeated Amalek. Moses sat down and wrote that account out, and, and uh, the Bible says that he did that. Um, do we ever see Joshua writing? Did people at the time of Joshua, the cavemen who lived at the time of Joshua, did, did he know how to write? Or read. You would think if he knew how to write, he knew how to read, right? Because the reading and writing go together. So did he know how to read or write? Yes. yes? How do you know? Because he read the book of the law to the Jewish Ooh. Well, um, what's Joshua 1.8? This book. A book means, right? Okay, I don't have to explain that. <laughs> well, Maybe. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. So what, did he, what is it saying? He read. In fact, if you go a couple places in Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, you go on down to the end, verse 26. Are you ready for this? And Joshua wrote. So point made. <laughs> uh, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. Okay, so who wrote the book of Joshua? Joshua did. Where did he put his writing? Into a book. And in whose book? God's book. The book of the law of Moses. The book of the law of God, the Bible says. Um, does it call it here, the book of the law of Moses? I don't think so. But, but he wrote and added his writing to the other written scriptures that were already in existence. In Joshua 24, 26, and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. Well, I was looking for the law of Moses. But either way, it's the same idea. I just wanted the word Moses with it. I think there's another place in chapter 21. I'm thinking for some reason, maybe not. 22 or 23, where it, where it specifically mentions the law of Moses, that Joshua, I think it's just interesting that Joshua added to Moses' writings as great of a writer as Moses was. Okay, um, Joshua is the only man in the Bible not to have a father. Okay, so son of none. Tradition says that Joshua was about 85 years old when he took over. 85. Um, let's say, uh, let's give it at that some perspective. So um, Moses was 80 when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. A few months after they leave Egypt is the first time we find Joshua on the scene. And what is Joshua doing the first time he's ever mentioned? What is he doing? Anybody know? Uh, not quite serving. Yes, he's the, he's the general leading them to battle against Amalek. Remember the story, then came Amalek, fought against Israel and Rephidim. So that's, Joshua is the leader there while Moses is up on the mountain getting Pentecostal. 
you know, with his hands raised. And Joshua's down there leading the army. That's, Joshua's a fighter. So it's also, there's so many le uh, great lessons. When God needed a strong leader who could put up with Israel in the wilderness, he chose a Moses. But when it was time to go to battle against the Canaanites, Moses was done and it was Joshua's turn. Um, God uses different people in different ways at different times. So Moses is 80 when they leave Egypt. Joshua is a general, so he's not a 20-year-old, right? He's not 25. He's probably a, a man, a grown man with skills in leading people to battle. So all indications are, I think, that Joshua is around 40 years old at least when, when the children of Israel leave Egypt. So he knew how to fight. He knew how to lead armies to battle. Where did he learn that? Hmm? He, he learned it in Egypt. How did he learn that in Egypt when he was making bricks? Right? Any thoughts? Huh? <laughs> Fighting the guards? <laughs> he organized all the slaves <laughs> and had them attack. Turn on. No. Um, it, it's wrong to assume that every Israelite was making bricks. Okay? A lot of Israelites made bricks. But we also know that, you know, there were people... Anyway, there, there, was, there were other professions. And so they weren't all doing that. So whatever, we don't know where he learned it. But he would have learned some skills in leading people into battle. He would not have been a, a young man. He'd have been a middle-aged man, probably, as the leader of the armies of Israel. So if he's 40 at that time, Joshua is, <clears throat> then that would stand, obviously, to reason that 40 years later, he's going to be 80 years old when they come into the land of Canaan. And then years go by from that, of conquering the land, and by the time you get to the end of the book of Joshua, he would be, I think the Bible says he died when he was 110 years old. <clears throat> so, anyway, you get the idea there. Probably about 80, 85 years old. Who else was 85 years old when they came into the land of Canaan? Caleb. And what, was, what does the Bible say about Caleb at 85 years old? <laughs> he thought he was the same. He said, I am just as strong as I was in the day that I was 45. And everybody else is probably like, huh? You should see yourself. But he thought he was at least as strong. I'm not saying he wasn't, but I've always thought that's kind of funny. Okay. Um, oh, let me uh, real quickly here just draw some uh, parallels before I get into the actual account. Um, children of Israel. They were in Egypt, where is our, uh, Egypt is a picture of what? The world. Egypt is a picture of the world. Um, Egypt is a picture of a sinner in bondage, okay, before salvation. Um, not as a struggling saved person, a struggling saint, but as a sinner before salvation. So Egypt is a picture of the world, a picture of a lost man. A picture of bondage, if you will. A picture of sin. <clears throat> All right. Next, the wilderness. The wilderness. What is that a picture of? I skipped something, but I'll come back to it. Yes. Life. Life? Eh, yes, it is. Life is a wilderness, folks. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> kind of dry and dusty. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else? So what happens right before the wilderness? The exodus. What's the exodus picture of? Salvation, right? It has to be. It's a picture of crossing over the Red Sea and crossing the place of bondage, leaving the place of bondage, and heading out into the Christian life. So the Exodus is a picture of salvation. The Exodus is a divide between Egypt and the wilderness. So the wilderness is a picture of the struggling life, if you will. It's a struggle. <clears throat> I love thinking, and I've preached uh, numerous times about the wilderness. God has a wilderness. 
the Bible says that the Lord found Israel. Remember the, the story, passage in Deuteronomy, it talks about the uh, Israel being the apple of God's eye. Okay, that passage actually says, right a few verses before that, that God found Israel, the apple of his eye, in a waste howling wilderness. And so this wilderness is a place to struggle, but it's a special place. And some of us, some of you maybe, you're going through in your life a time of struggle, maybe even spiritually struggling. So what does that mean? Life's over? You're a waste? No. <laughs> That's just a place to go through to get to where you're supposed to go. And remember in our earlier uh, example here on the map, let me just quickly go back there. Um, Mm, no, I don't want to do that. This one. Uh, remember what God did. God led them into the wilderness because He wanted them to learn the lessons. He wanted them to struggle. And if there's anything you can learn, it's good to struggle. It's good to struggle. Um, I've had plenty of my share of struggles. And, and you go through those kinds of things, and God will bring you out the other side. So the wilderness is that. And then when you cross over... The Jordan River. <clears throat> you finally get to heaven, right? Wrong. Crossing the Jordan is not a picture of crossing into heaven. Always cracks me up. What's that? Shall we gather at the river? You ever, you ever sing that song? You know what that's talking about? A funeral. Shall we gather at the river? The, the, the idea of crossing a, the Jordan is not talking about crossing to heaven. Um, sorry, I think I said that wrong. Shall we gather at the river is talking... Anyway, the, the, the crossing of the Jordan... I'm getting confused myself. The crossing of the Jordan is not a picture of crossing into heaven. Crossing into Canaan land. Canaan is not heaven. Okay, there's no enemies in heaven. There's no defeats in heaven. On and on. So Canaan is not a picture of that. Yes. Canaan is the victorious Christian life. So in the land of Canaan, you should see victory. And what kind of people are in the land of Canaan that you're going to have victory over? People who are what? Much bigger than you are. Problems that are much bigger than you are. You're going to feel like a what? A grasshopper. You're going to feel very tiny compared to the problems that you find in the land of Canaan. So land of Canaan is a picture of the victorious Christian life. It's a picture, if you will, the natural man in Egypt, the carnal man struggling with sin and problems of life, figuring out to trust in God, and the spiritual man having victory over Jericho by just walking, by just obeying God. Okay, we say by just walking. The real reason they had victory at Jericho is because they obeyed God. And God said, shut your mouth, no talking. Oh, now I want you to start walking. And they walked around, you know. Do it again. Do it a third day. Okay, here we go. Um, so we were at Jericho not that long ago. It's not a big place. It had taken them. Uh, I've, I've done a little bit of computing and and. We have the perfect scenario here. It's called walking around the lake. So, guys, you don't walk around the lake. You run around the lake. Girls, some of you walk around the lake. How long does it take to walk around the lake? Sorry? 15 minutes for a three-quarter mile. Okay, so um, if the city of Jericho is... 500 feet across, let's just say, 500 feet across by 500 feet across in uh, diameter. They didn't walk up against the walls and walk 500 feet around a circle. They would have walked out further away from the walls and, you know, obviously for good reason. And so all indications are that we have here about the size, of, probably about the size of what it would take to walk around the city of Jericho, about a three-quarter mile. Um, so that's an interesting way to think of that 
think of Jericho out in the middle of our lake, <laughs> you know, and, um, and you're walking around the city. Do that once a day. That's one thing. Do it seven times on the seventh day. So on. we're getting ahead of ourselves, Jericho. All right, so let's go into back now to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1 through 5, we're going to see uh, the entering of the land, <clears throat> the entering of the land of Canaan. And as I already mentioned, this is an invasion, and this invasion is going to uh, cross and split the land of Canaan. So, any military guy will tell you that a great way to, to conquer is to divide and conquer. And so that's the way you want to think of this. There's going to be a central campaign aimed at taking out the middle section, and then there's going to be a southern campaign and then there's going to be a northern campaign. So that's exactly the way this is done by Joshua. Very smart, very savvy in understanding uh, people's mentality. Um, God helped or did a lot of it, of course, already before they ever got there. What was there in the hearts of all the Canaanites? Fear. fear. And fear will make you panic and it'll make you do dumb things, make you make bad decisions. And so uh, Rahab kind of spills the beans that everybody's scared of them. And so that's a great uh, factor on Joshua's side uh, as they come in. They know that God's, the God of the children of Israel is a powerful God. All right, so we're going to see in chapters 1 through 5 the entering of the land, and then we'll see in chapters 6 through 12 overcoming the land, and then in chapters 30, 13 to 24 the uh, claiming the land, uh, dividing it into the tribal areas. So, let me go here again. Um, so just to the north of the Dead Sea, uh, that large area, just to the north of that is where Jericho is. And it's, just, uh, it's about five or six miles, and of course it's a big area, but five or six miles kind of to the north and to the west of where the Dead Sea is. Um, let me just say, I, don't, I can't be 110% sure that they know where the site of Jericho actually is. There are several places that they say it is. The most likely is the one that has been discovered by Kath, not Kathleen Kenyon, by, uh, what's the other guy? Was that you? Uh, anyway. I just, I just now started thinking about it. So anyway, Kathleen Kenyon, she said it's not the place. Um, an earlier archaeologist, I think, very positively identified it. Later archaeologist, John Garsting, John Garsting thank you. Uh, he excavated there in the 20s and 30s, 1930s mainly, and 40s. Kathleen Kenyon came along in the 50s and said, no, this is not the place because we're, we don't see things here from that time period. Well, she didn't see it, but that didn't mean it wasn't there. And so in the 80s and the 90s and two, early 2000s, another group went in there, uh, Institutes of Biblical Research, and what's his name? Uh, this guy. Uh, uh, nope. Anyway. Anyway, so he went in and he has... I should have his name, but this guy has a doctor's degree in pottery from the, the Bronze Era. Okay, so this guy is an absolute expert in pottery. <laughs> don't you wish you could just study pottery for like 10 years? So, no, I don't either. But, uh, uh, Le uh, Wood, thank you. It's not Leon Wood. Uh, anyway, his last name is Wood. We're getting there. We're getting closer. But uh, anyway, so I, I believe this is the place. Um, El uh, Sultan or something like that um, is the name of it, but uh, of the, uh, the tell where this is at. So, all right, so uh, the entering of the land, and this is an invasion, as I mentioned. Let me give you uh, some points underneath this for our outline. Chapters 1 through 5. First of all, in chapter 1, the commission to Joshua. The commission to Joshua. Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people. So Joshua chapter 1, Joshua is the new leader. Moses is gone, and now it's time to step out in faith on your own. And so evidently, Joshua was kind of afraid. Can you uh, tell me why that seems kind of obvious that he was a little fearful or uh, afraid? If you're looking at chapter 1, you'd probably see a word or two jump out at you over and over. Yes? God told him not to be afraid. <laughs> okay, that's good. God did say be not... Uh, uh, well, he didn't say be not afraid. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, he did. Verse 9, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. So God told him not to be afraid. What else did God tell him? Hmm? Be courageous, be strong, and very courageous, over and over again. By the way, if you go back to Deuteronomy, when the switch was actually taking place, Moses there also and the Lord say to Joshua, don't be afraid, be strong, and very courageous. And so now this is kind of reviewing that as well in Joshua chapter 1. So Joshua is encouraged to have faith as they go into the land. You say, well, yeah, they needed faith. Well, would you be scared? To go into this land that you don't, you know that there are cities with great walls, you know that there's giants. These giants have a reputation. Um, they, the Bible says that uh, the spies, when they came here 38 and a half, 40 years earlier, that they said that these giants would spit out the inhabitants of the land. Like chew them up and spit them out. So there's reason to be afraid. And Joshua has his faith built up. Moses had his, uh, Moses had a personal um, appearance, a meeting with God before he ever went to the big responsibility that he was given, the burning bush experience. Joshua now is going to have the same experience. Joshua is going to go to his walls of Jericho and look it over, and God himself, the captain of the Lord's host, is going to meet him there. And uh, build his faith. All of this is to build his faith. We need the same thing. So this commission to Joshua is to, uh, to have faith. And we'll just keep it that simple. Have faith and obedience. Do what I say. Go. You're going to go into this land and you're going to take it over. Number two, chapter two, is the covenant with Rahab. The covenant with Rahab. Joshua chapter two. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. Any thoughts on the number of spies? Okay, so then Joshua says, You know, last time we sent too many spies. We only had two. I was one of them, Joshua says. Two came back with a good report, and so I'm going to only send two this time. <laughs> and so these two men go across, and they view Jericho. They come to the city. Just imagine the pure excitement and thrill that this must have been. Come walking up to the gate of Jericho, act like you're a, you know, you know of course I'm sure they were wearing something, you know, turban type thing to cover their heads and, they act like they're just a normal farmer from not too far away, and they walk into this huge enemy territory. Uh, must have been unbelievably exciting. Verse 5, it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm reading towards the end. Um, they came into a harlot's house named Rehab and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight, the children of Israel, to search out the country. Whew. I don't know how they found out. But, man, the word was out. Um, anyway, but this covenant with Rahab. So Rahab is, a, is known as a woman of great faith. Let's note down some reasons, some, some evidences of her faith. Can you help me with that? Evidences of Rahab's faith. Of course, one of the evidences is that she hid the spies in her house uh, up on the rooftop, right? Uh, underneath a bunch of stalks of, was it, flax? I think so. So, she hid the spies. Anything else? Anything you want to add to that? Yes? No? Um, like, God, 
okay? I, I'm more looking for, on this side of it, though, things that she did or whatever. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Took faith for her to believe that. Very good. Anybody else? Yes. She convinced her family. She convinced her family. Good. Um, she confessed to the spies that everybody's scared to death. And so she's clearly joining sides. You know, she's not riding the fence. She's joining sides. Um, verse number 9 of chapter 2 says, She said to the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. So she believed. That's, that's what that is. She had faith. I know the Lord. This is your land. How she knew that, I don't know. I mean, how did she know that they were, that there was, that was the intent of them to get this land from their God that supposedly was giving them all of this land to them. So uh, she knew that and she believed that. So, um, Of course, she was delivered from judgment when the city fell. Her house was spared. So again, these are all demonstrations of her faith, uh, I think. So, <clears throat> All right. Um, who did she marry? All the ladies are like, I know who that was. I'm teasing. Uh, Emily? Um, I can't remember his name, but it was one of the spies. I remember. One of the spies, wow. Love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It starts with an S. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just think fish. Salmon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, salmon. Salmon, salmon. Uh, we, know, we don't know for sure that he was one of the spies. But we do know who he was. Because Matthew chapter 1 actually says, Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 actually says that uh, Boaz was born of Salmon and Rachab, Rahab. So this is definitely Rahab married Salmon, Salmon. Um, Probably, possibly one of the spies uh, who came into her house. Of course, she's... Okay, there is debate over her profession. So the Bible calls her a harlot on numerous occasions. So there is debate, though, that she... That that simply meant that she was an innkeeper. She had a place where there were harlots. I don't know, but regardless, she was a wicked sinner... And she was involved in something that had to do whether she herself was a harlot or not. She was involved in the practice. So I think to me that's the, you, you can't just totally pull her out of this. She was, she was involved in this practice. Um, and so she believed, and of course she becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David. Uh, so it's not too far down the line. Um, her great Great grandson or a great grandson, not, not the double great, would marry Ruth. You know? Seven. Sorry? Seven was Boaz's father. Oh, so it would be a, her son. Her son married Ruth, yes. She, anyway, so uh, it's interesting the quick connect just from this little short time period to David and uh, the establishment of the southern kingdom there, Jerusalem. All right, so chapter 2 is all about Rahab, and uh, what a great story that is. Uh, she hides them in her house, she stands with them, and when it's her opportunity to get out, she uh, is able to make it out. <clears throat> um, by the way, let me quickly say here, um, the city of Jericho was known for its large walls. The Bible describes those walls. There's a lot of interesting details about that city and how it took place. Somewhere I have pictures. I probably didn't bring them. Actually, I just thought of this. I do have a great demonstration of how those uh, city walls would have fallen out and uh, created a ramp to go up into the city. 
Uh, I don't have them with me. No, but the Bible describes when they do get to Jericho that every man went around the city and then every man, when the walls fell, every man went straight up before him. So, uh, Bryant Wood, the archaeologist, says that he just wanted to find, you know, they, they can't ever prove, they can't just say conclusively that this brick shows that it fell from a height of, you know, 30 feet down to the ground in the year 1400 BC. They can't prove that. But what they can say is the Bible says that the walls fell out and created a ramp up into the city. So is there evidence that the walls fell out? And absolutely there's evidence. Um, the Bible says that, uh, that there were walls. Duh. You know, there were walls. Well, Kathleen Kenyon said in 1400 BC there were no walls. So somebody's wrong, <laughs> you know. I think I'm going to believe the Bible. Um, and on and on. So the evidence shows that the place where they believe to be Jericho, that that could be the place. Okay, so anyway, a lot of fun stuff there with uh, Jericho. The mountains aren't too far away. The Bible says that they left, verse 16, they ran to the hide in the mountains until the pursuers were gone, then they went across. But it's miles wide, the valley there, uh, near Jericho there is many miles wide, 15 miles wide at least, you know, down to the Jordan River and, and out and across. So I'll, I'll, I'll have some more pictures. I'll try to bring some more pictures of this. Chapter 3, the crossing of the Jordan. Let's just quickly touch on this. The crossing of the Jordan. Jordan of Israel, many years earlier, actually, these children of Israel, it was their parents who had crossed the Red Sea. And not only their parents, anybody who was over 40 years old as a little kid had crossed the Red Sea. Everybody follow me there? Mm -hmm. So these people had to have their own faith built. And so Moses has them come down to the Jordan River and they're going to just step out into the Jordan and the Jordan parts and they walk across on dry ground. So this is a... Uh, the same type of experience as the Red Sea build their faith that God was going to give them the victory if they trusted. So the crossing of the Jordan is this trial of, of, of faith. Um, what led the way across the Jordan? The cloud, but the ark of the covenant um, and the priest, the Bible says that they just walked and the, that as they stepped, the water parted. And so there's some interesting debates on that, but um, it's possible that as the, the water, the Jordan was flooded at that time. So if you've ever been in a flooded area, uh, like a river, a flooded river, at the time of the flooding, the actual little banks of the river are way in, completely underwater, and the water will be out in the fields. Just imagine walking through those fields when that, if, it's, if that was the way it worked. Walk out in the shallow water, not knowing if any time you're going to step off into the riverbank. But as they walked, the water receded and moved out of their way, and they walked across on dry ground. So very clearly, God was demonstrating again His power. That's chapter 3. Chapter 4, the commemoration of stones. The commemoration of stones. So they were told, and again, this seems a little confusing to me, but... It looks like there were stones in a pile left in the middle of the river, and there were stones left on the west side of the river once they crossed. So, by the way, don't go looking for those stones. They're long gone. But in those times, people would come back and look at that pile of stones and say, hey, you remember what happened here? So that was for them. That was thousands of years ago. But you can have your own experiences in your own life, and you set up your own pile of stones as a memorial. Don't do it in the dorm. Um, but you can set it up as a memorial for something that God did for you. You understand? So uh, this commemoration of stones is a witness of faith. You notice the theme here. It's all in faith. The commemoration of stones is the witness of faith. Uh, God's 
faithfulness was proved here at the Jordan River, and they wanted to leave a reminder, a commemoration of that, those pile of stones. And then cap letter E, or whatever you have, number five, chapter five is the camp at Gilgal. The camp at Gilgal. <clears throat> so, number of things that happen here. They, they cross the Jordan, and now they're going to set up camp. They got to get settled in before they're able to send out their armies to war, of course. And so there's several things that happen here at the camp at Gilgal. And this this um, is what I'm calling a pruning of their faith. So now they're going to get their faith actually tested and see if they are, now that they're in the land, they're going to obey. And so there's several things that they do here at the camp at Gilgal. First, the Passover is celebrated. They celebrate the Passover. All right, so that tells us the time of year that it is, right? It's April, our April. It's, it's their uh, whatever that month. Hmm? I don't remember. Anyway, but it's our April, April 14th is Passover. And so they celebrate the Passover. That was, unfortunately, that was only the third time they had celebrated the Passover. The first time was the night it happened. The second time was when they were at Mount Sinai. And then in the 40 years of wandering, they didn't celebrate the Passover. And the Bible says in Joshua chapter 4 that this is the third time now that they're going to celebrate the Passover. Next, another thing that takes place at this camp is that the manna ceased to fall. The manna ceased to fall. There's no more manna. You've got to go get your own food. Um, that puts some urgency on you, doesn't it? Uh, we can't sit in this camp very long. There's a little stuff growing around us here in the valley around Jericho there. But we can't stay here. We have to get people into their homes, you know, out into their cities. They have to fight. They got to win. And they got to move in if they're going to eat. It's a little motivation, right? Um, so the manna doesn't fall anymore. Chapter uh, 5. I said chapter 4. Chapter 5. Um, another thing that happens here at the camp is the appearance of Christ. The captain of the Lord's host appears to Joshua. And so this is an Old Testament appearance of Christ. We know that because Joshua worships him. And uh, this is not just an angel. This is the appearance of the Lord. There's one more thing I hesitate to mention, but it's something that also takes place at this camp, is the Hebrew identification which is the Jewish rite, R-I-T-E, of circumcision. And so they're identifying all of the young men who had not had this done during the time of the wilderness wanderings. Uh, all of them now are identified as Jews. And so that was also done here at Gilgal before they went to the battles. Okay, so we haven't even gotten to Jericho yet. Chapters 1 through 5. <clears throat> Roman numeral 2. Roman numeral 2. So we see them entering into the land. Roman numeral 2 is going to be the overcoming of the land. So we're going to split this three ways. I, I like to see these side blocks in different ways you can see these. But So the Dead Sea, the children of Israel up on the side of Moab. Um, I have pictures of me down here along this side of the Dead Sea looking out. And you just see miles of valley. And then way off, you can see 10, 15 miles away, you can see this huge plateau. And all of that plateau is in Moab and Ammon and so on, across the Dead Sea, uh, that other side. And there's just a vast expanse there on the side. Looks like a big hill coming down, all one huge hill coming down. And the children of Israel are seeing down into the valley as they're coming down. They can see Jericho off in the distance, 10, 15 miles away. The people of Jericho definitely, most certainly, could see them coming. And, you know, were, of course, very afraid 
And so they're holed up in Jericho. The Bible says it was the time of the harvest. And we have, I've seen many pictures of it, and there's actual uh, clay jars that were found at the site of Jericho that were buried deep in the ground, of course, when it was all th thrown together and burned. And the middle of those clay jars still has uh, seeds in it from the time of Joshua that a huge part of it was burned. Of course, some of that was sealed off and somehow has... And I'm not saying they're completely coherent seeds, but they're, they're the remains of that. So the point is, it was the time of harvest. And these people at Jericho saw them coming and knew that, you know, they had to know that their time was, was coming quickly. Okay, so we're going to divide it up by the central campaign, the southern campaign, and the northern campaign. Let's stop there today. Let you go a few minutes early, and we'll pick up with the campaigns on our next class period.